right so that it all becomes a one product. So when you turn the bottle over, as you have some in front of you, there's nothing in there. It's clear. And you know this 318, 18, 19, you cannot freeze it. It will not freeze. It's a very high quality. It will be fed right to the plant. You can actually, uh, it's actually um, fed to cattle and things like that through supplements. And um, so it's interesting to see. We make a wide range of uh, starter plant foods, 99, 318, 18s, 515, 15. They all have a place. Triple 10, 525, 1533, 1644 for the lawn care industry. Used to use that for pre tassel on corn. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that because this application we've been doing for about 14 years now is really making some good money. In fact, I haven't hit less than 22 bushels 12 years in a row. And this is a widespread of coverage uh, territory. Now that's 22 bushel. Most of them coming in in the 30s. Think about it. 30 bushel, one crack, one application at the right time. It's kind of like starter plant food at the right time when the seed germinates and that phosphate's there and it can grab it at the right time. It makes all the difference in the world. It moves down and it's starting to look for water. It's, it's getting itself uh, together and it's setting the path for the direction it's going to go for the rest of the year. Because that first day is very critical to a plant, no different than to an animal, making sure it's got all the good stuff it needs, milk, you know, milk is a very critical, and uh, phosphate to a plant is critical. So we manufactured those types of products, and then we came along in um, the 80s, a later part of 80s, and created probably one of the best products I've ever seen in response, and it's a liquid calcium. Um, now there's chelated calcium, you guys probably heard of chelated calcium, this is a little different. We also manufacture a chelated calcium, but this calcium, to chelate it, we have to take all the inner ingredients out, which really makes this thing really nice. And uh, what we were looking at with this calcium and why we create it, fellas, on the research farm, you know, you, you try to make everything right, you know, your preparation of the soil and the seed depth is correct and consistent and you use a good genetic of seed and all that good stuff and you make sure you got the elements in the soil that you're looking for. And so everything was good. Our, our, uh, I'm kind of giving an idea just from memory on what the pHs were. And they ran anywhere from 6.5 up to uh, 6.9. We had some sevens. Um, base saturation on calcium was anywhere from um, 71. We had them as high as uh, 83%. Our base saturation on K, we were in that three, three to five percent range. Uh, Calcium-wise, we had anywhere from on these particular research fields from 2,200 pounds all the way up to 4,600 pounds an acre. Then what we did, plant the crop, let it germinate, and then we started testing the leaf tissue from the first first one come out of its life. You know, it, it come up, you got your first leaf, you start testing it. We started testing the seedlings upon germination too, just interesting to see what that little thing contains. And um, every plant that was out there at a very young age was deficient in one element. What do you think that element was? The most deficient element. Any ideas? Calcium. Calcium. That's exactly right. And you know, <clears throat> you sit there and you think, okay, I've got a good pH, I've got a good base saturation of calcium, I've got loads of calcium up there. What's the problem? Solubility. It's one of the reasons why Ken Pullman and my grandfather created water-soluble test reports. A lot of guys are using them now, and I'm glad to see that, because it really gives you a good idea of what's out there. You know, you may have 400 pounds of potash out there. How much of it's truly soluble? Because a plant doesn't care if it's not soluble. If it can't digest it, it means nothing to it. But we like to see those numbers, you know, 400 pounds, 100 pounds of phosphate, and boy, we're good to go, right? Not so. The solubility makes a big difference. Again, fellas, I'm not uh, saying that we don't grow good crops and you guys don't grow good crops, do a good job, but I can tell you what I've seen. And, and we can really, really move these yields up in a good positive way. And uh, so anyways, we go back to the calcium, and so the only answer <laughs> we came up with is add more calcium, add more calcium, still came up with the same result the next year. And so we finally said, okay, let's take calcium carbonate, okay, 
like when you take a ton of lime, how, how many, under 2,000 pounds of lime, how many of the good stuff do you think's in there? 600 pounds. 400, well, 400 to 600 pounds, exactly right. Just depending on where it comes from and who's the best. If it was, if it's technically 100%, yeah, it'd be about 600 pounds. Yep, and that's it, 600 pounds. The rest of it's filler, basically. You know, the 600 pounds, and then you gotta say, how much of that 600 pounds can I actually retrieve and, and utilize? And so the, the thing about calcium is kind of like nitrogen, and one of the reasons why nitrogen's in the problem and phosphates at times is that nitrogen's a mass flowing element, and so is calcium as a mass flowing element, believe it or not. Both of them are mass flows. Calcium carbonate, I should say. And so what we were seeing was, I'm gonna draw a, kind of a, a battery type thing here and put a positive and a negative. And when I look at soils, I look at them a lot like this because you've got cations, you've got ions. And did you know that there's a negative, there's, a, there's electrical charges down there. It's amazing how they work. It really is. Has anybody went out there and plugged your soil in lately? Into a socket, you know? <laughs> Re-energized it? If you can't do that, all you got to do is use Instagrill. We've got the energizer in there. But it's amazing when these things get compacted, these little colloids or soil colloids, that's your soil particles, and when they get compacted, which, hey, we're all guilty of it, we're farmers ourselves, and there's been times that we didn't get in there, we wouldn't have planted the crop, or we wouldn't have got the crop off. And so unfortunately, there's times you go in there maybe a little wet, and, and you think, ah, you know, I'll do a little work on it, it'll decompact. It's amazing how long it takes to correct that problem from that one time. It, it's uh, Iowa State did some research on compaction and did it over 12 years. And they purposely compacted an area and uh, left it there and monitored the yield difference. You know that thing was still persistently correct and, and, and uh, yield loss after 12 years? Unbelievable. So compaction's a real problem, but when you squeeze these platelets together, or let's say that I've got an imbalanced soil, so I've got a lot of magnesium, by the way, most soils that I've been in lately are pretty high in magnesium. What's the soils around here like? Anybody know what your magnesium levels are? Are they high, Meg? Any idea on percentage or you remember if it's like above 20% or below 20? It really doesn't matter. When it gets high magnesium, what happens to your soil? Any ideas? You lose nitrogen, and you get a very hard soil, too. Very hard to penetrate, very hard to move water through, very hard to breathe. In fact, it's interesting, you know, when they went up in Vietnam, uh, they actually took high rates of magnesium and hydrous to make the runways, to land the big, big planes on. And think about that. And hydrous and magnesium, and boy, they had concrete runways. So when magnesium gets out of balance, now we need magnesium, it's a very, very important element, you gotta have it. But when it's, when it's out of balance, then it becomes a big issue. And there's a lot of things. You know, sodium, you get high salts, which a lot of plant foods contain a tremendous amount of high salts. You get sodium levels out of balance in the soil, and you know, if you have a little dry spell, you get a little bit of rain, that plant has a hard time even taking up rain if that sodium level is extremely high. So in a drought situation, such as Western Kentucky was for a couple years here not long ago, I'm not sure how you guys, I think you guys have been pretty decent here for a while now, haven't you, for rainfall? Two, three years. Of, of dry or pretty good weather? Wet. Wet. Wet, wet, huh? And so um, out there, you could just look at the soil reports and the sodium levels kept climbing and climbing because Mother Nature normally washes it down with rain. It pushes that sodium level down. When she comes up, it creates a problem and actually makes a plant hard to drink water, believe it or not. That's something. So anyways, going back to this, I look at a soil like a battery, positive negative charges. And uh, if you get, like I say, high magnesium sitting on here or a bunch of magnesium on these platelets, or you get a, a high rate of any type of element or, or compaction, it slows that process down just like you had corrosion on a battery then you cannot convert plant foods easily. Manure, who uses manure? Anybody raise animals here? Put manure on. 
And if you've got high mags or you've got platelets that are coated, it's hard to convert that manure over to usable plant food. There's a report out there too called Composition of Soils. And we talk about putting on 200 pounds of this and 150 pounds of that. Did you know that in the Corn Belt area and, and, and surrounding areas, that there's naturally 40,000 pounds of potash in six inches of soil? 40,000 pounds, up to 10,000 pounds of phosphate. How much do we really need? A soil sample gives you what is supposed to be soluble of that. Then we take a water soluble report, which goes one step further. But it's amazing what's out there if we can just unlock it. And part of it's getting, the whole thing is getting back to getting the impurities out, getting the, the microbial life, getting the life back in the soil. We've done a wonderful job of kicking its butt and it, it is hurting us. Now I know we see some yields out there, but not what we can. I mean, the potential is tremendous. And, and when you work with guys that feed, you know, the cattle and hogs and stuff, it's amazing what I hear from them and the feed value of what we're producing. And, and it's just getting the soil back to the basics, natural state. So anyways, we create a liquid calcium. Again, we're going back to, well, it mass flows, right? So how are we gonna keep it in that spot? You know, we're only looking at three gallon, five gallon, seven gallons an acre, not, not putting on two ton or 2,000 pounds or 3,000 or 4,000 pounds. We're putting on five gallons. Well, we started researching for chelating agents, and we came across a chelating agent that was a tremendous deal for us. It kept the calcium there, but what we kind of see, when you go back to this, well, I'll give you an example. There's a bottle, it's called a leachade. It's a glass jar with holes in it, and it's got a collection plate in the bottom. They call them leachades in the, in the chemist lab. And what you do is you fill this thing full of soil, and then you take your products, and water, you simulate rain, and you let it absorb through here just to see what did we push, what did we move through the soil? What happened? Calcium by itself went right through the soil. Very, very little was held in the soil, believe it or not, and mass flowed right down. I'm not really talking about a jar gave big, but you got to represent somehow. And so, when we took the calcium with the chelating agent and the energizer, put it, put it in the same process, we found very little calcium move through. But we did pick up some other elements, amazing enough. Like magnesium. Magnesium is a tough one when it gets hard. So you can't just pull it out and get rid of it, but you can't push it down. Where, where's, our, where's our plants feed at? Do they feed in the top inch or is it two feet down the soil? Where do they feed from? The top six inches, top five to six inches. So if you've got high magnesium and you can push it down, you release a tremendous amount of food value up here. Tremendous amount. What we've seen with the inner ingredients, the calcium, was actually helping to cleanse, or what we call cleansing the colloids of the soil. We can actually knock magnesium off and replace it with calcium. See, it's like little chairs on these platelets, and everybody has a place at their dinner table. You've got phosphate, potassium, calcium, zinc, manganese, magnesium. But when they're out of balance, somebody's kind of sucking up all the food. It's not fair, he's not sharing. And um, what happens is, is we were actually able to see some of these magnesium and, and make it a little more even, knock them off of that seat and replace it with calcium. How important is calcium to a plant? Cell wall. It's essential for the Krebs cycle of energy, for generating energy or sugars. To me, it's a, one of the most important elements in the beginning because, you know, he, he mentioned something about a natural insecticide, and we've been promoting that for since we come out with the Instacal and see, be 35 years, 37 years ago. And, and our produce growers use our Instacal and our Instasol for insecticides. They don't use any insecticides on their, on their produce, none. Do it all with the Instacal and Instasol. So it can be done. No insecticides. I like that. I like that because I really don't care to eat it. But um, so we've seen tremendous things happen by the calcium application. And we water soluble samples, I mentioned something about that the last time. Water soluble gives you an idea of how much nutrition in that soil is actually usable. Following the calcium applications, we've seen that increase tremendously. The water soluble side kept coming up and up and up. And that's what we were after. 
the magnesium would come in place. We could see percolation of the soil coming back, where you can naturally move water up and down. When that soil becomes so tight, the water comes and it sits there. If the soil's where it should be, you should be able to take that water up when you need it, and you should be able to move her down. It should naturally flow. But when she comes tight, it can't. Earthworm populations die down. I mean, it's tremendous. I mean, you know, we really don't think about it. See a couple earthworms out there, but who go out there? Does anybody go out and count them? I don't specifically go out and count them, but I have at times monitored them. And they produce a tremendous amount of nutrition on their own. Their secretions is really great plant food. So if you increase that population, they can add not just aeration, but they can add nutritional value. You can't do it with conventional fertilizers. I guarantee it. You cannot do it. So that's kind of what's behind our program. I like using the, uh, the starters in the row. Like I say, they're packed full of nutritional value, not just 3, 18, 18, 9, 18, 9. It's the inner ingredients inside them that really make it what it is. Um, the calcium program that we got is a tremendous product. I recommend it on every acre we utilize. And um, just to get the things going, add some calcium to it. And um, the other thing is, is um, we also make a nitrogen product. And I know that we talked a little bit about that. And, and in theory, he's exactly right. It's going to take a while for some of us not to use nitrogen on corn, though, I think. You know, in our, in our mindsets, right? I mean, it's not an easy thing to do to drop it out, but um, you certainly can reduce it tremendous amounts. And, and we prove that just by split applying it. Do you guys split apply your nitrogen now, or does it all go down at one time? Are you splitting it up? And you know this, that's helped tremendously because you conserve a little bit. So anytime you can reduce it down, that's the key. And, um, you know, using some of the products that he's talking about in manufacturing and, and make use of it. Uh, but in the meantime, we do have a liquid nitrogen that's a food grade urea nitrogen. It can be foliar fed to the plant. Okay, we can combine it with our plant food products and such as corn. You know, we got certain times of year that corn is foliar fed. You got your seed starter. It's kind of like corn grows kind of like this as, as far as uptake. You know, you got your seedling here. And at this time, she's taking up a little nutrition. But as that plant grows, that demand goes up and up and up. And so here's where we call ear initiation. And believe it or not, this should be done at three leaf stage, okay? Because soon after that corn plant is determining the size of the ear and the rounds and the kernels long. So if you can fill that plant full of food, it'll set a better ear every time. If it's a little dry, how, you know, it's hard to get food up into that plant because it moves with water, right? So if it's dry, you can't get plant food up in the plant. So what, how important does foyer feed become? It's tremendous beneficial and useful, and I'm glad to see guys using it more and more. In fact, I have several of my growers now that are actually going across their fields twice so they can put herbicide on separate from foyer because they're seeing such a great response from it. You know, it costs a lot of money to put an acre of corn out, don't it? So if we can, if we can increase our potential there tremendously, this is one of them. Okay, first thing you do, you got to set the path of that seedling's life. Give it what it needs in the beginning. Okay, some, some phosphate, some zinc, and get it moving in the right direction. Then at your three leaf stage, now you can put that with herbicides. I'm not saying you can't. Always, always do a compatible test to see how they mix well, but you can put them together. But I tell you, I do like the idea of going separate. Um, I just spent some time with a fellow out in Illinois by the name of Walker, and um, they right now are farming 37,000 acres. Can you believe that? 37. How many times do you think he sees each one of his fields a year? Do you think he ever sees them? No. Never. But they've got seven planters that goes at one time, and they're big. And so they use liquid plant food. And um, he didn't foyer feed. But he's got some friends that I've been working with for a few years. And they keep hearing what's going on. And he goes over and visits them. And he sees the kind of yield they're producing and their corn and how it looks and what they're, what they're seeing happening in the soil. So now they're interested in the Instagrow program. He doesn't foyer feed, but he's going to go over that acreage separately to foyer feed it. That's a lot of, that's a big commitment to make. But it works, so he's seen it work. 
This is important here, here, and what I do here is a little 31818 most generally, um, and I put just a little bit of super in with it, right into the leaf tissue, and then here is pre-tassel. Pre-tassel, now this is uh, two weeks prior to tassel. Now you can go three weeks or three and a half, depending on your sprayer, you can get over top of it, and some of it's done by airplane, helicopter too. But you can, on a big sprayer, get over this at three weeks prior to tassel. This is the one here that I told you that right now I'm not hitting less than 22 bushel, 12 years running. No less. Our top was 76. And the control was 176 bushel. The control wasn't bad. 76 bushel, pretty hot. But that's only, you know, that's not consistency. I mean, that happened. That, that was still pretty nice to see. Most of them are seeing or realizing between 22 and 35, 36 bushel. The application will cost you somewhere between 35 bucks. So if, if you're producing 22 bushel corn or 30 bushel corn, even at today's prices, you're still going to profit uh, $80 an acre. That's not bad profit, is it? If it's something you've never done before. Those are the kind of things I guess I look at what we can do to increase our bottom line on that acre. We can grow different crops. Oats is almost uh, five bucks a bushel, believe it or not. <clears throat> I've never seen it. He says he's seen oats up that high. I've never seen oats up that high before. But, um, you know, we, we grew 800 acres of canola for the last five years. Of course, we had a market not too far away, so it made it a little easier. But, you know, when prices were down before they came up, we ended up growing some canola and grew something different for our price per acre to get our most return. <clears throat> but if you're growing corn, soybeans, soybeans are a good price right now. They can do wonders, but you got to feed them. Can't rely just on everything. Now, if you got the soil perfectly balanced, she'll do everything for you you need. And there's no joke about that. You wouldn't need nothing. Nothing. But I tell you what, it's hard to get that perfect balance. We've been doing it for a long time. We got some fields very close. Now, we haven't done a lot of work with hormones and things like that that we are now, and we'll be doing a little more work with. And uh, because anything that helps the farmer, we're interested in that, because that's what we want to do. We want to help you guys make the profit that, that you need to make to keep moving. The other thing is, is think about the inputs you're putting on. I wasn't going to bring this up, but I am going to bring it up. I, uh, I found this kind of disturbing. You guys can go to the, go to this, uh, and I was affected by this for my family too. Alzheimer's. What's the other one that goes with Alzheimer's? It's um, Parkinson's. Did you know right now one in eight Americans are diagnosed with it and not at age 65 anymore. How about 49, 47 years old? 2050, they project one in four Americans will have it. At 47, you're done. That's terrible. And you know where it's coming from? what we grow. That's a heck of a statement, fellas. Take some time and read this sometime. You guys can go find it yourself. It's quite a big report, but they did a really good job. These aren't false numbers. These are real numbers. Think about how scary that is. 50 years from now, I don't know if God will let me still live or not, but if not, I'll be dead. But I've got children that will be here and grandchildren. It's important. And so our inputs are here. I'm not here to tell you and make you try to feel bad, but we need to wake up and look at what we're doing. Seriously. Something's not right. Any questions, fellas? I'm not going to hold up food because I know the belly rules. Of course, I don't know how hard, how uh, doesn't it? The belly usually rules uh, what we do, right? And we got to feed ourselves nutritionally. I don't know how far close we are to supper time, so I don't know if you want me to talk some more or what you'd like me to do. Oh, uh, questions and answers. I do want to mention two things, though. I don't know if you have it in front of you right now, but if you don't, grab one. Part of our program is not just seed applications and foliar feeding. You know, and to, to, to wean yourself off of some of the commercial grade fertilizers and try to get back to a natural <coughs> state, you've, you've got to look at more than just starters and foliar feeding. We also take advantage of the crop residue. You know, your fodder, your stover contains a tremendous amount of nutrition. You know, 140 bushel crop of corn will have almost 200 pounds of potash, 60 pounds, 60 to 70 pounds of uh, phosphate, and 90 pounds of nitrogen. Think about that. We don't get it all back, especially if we do nothing with it. 
depending on our organics, microbial activity, how well she, do, you know, if, if we work it under, we're leaving it on top, all that input makes a difference. But why not take advantage of that? And so we've been doing that, and that's one of the, one of the ways I've been able to wean my guys off of dry fertilizer is, uh, or these inputs that are hurting our soils is by taking advantage of that stove or that fodder and uh, converting it back over to plant food, creating your own manufacturing facility. This is called NCS. If you guys don't have one, please grab one. And uh, it's 4% nitrogen, 8% calcium, 6% sulfur. Sulfur is a very critical element. We've been promoting it for 48 years. I just now started hearing about it in magazines well, they're behind 46 years, but at least we're talking about it. Yeah, Davis just, UC Davis just caught up with you last year. Did he? They, they reported it as the, the fourth. Yeah, major, major element. Major yeah. element. Yeah. We've been doing it for 48 years. It's a very important element because where do you think protein and test weight comes from? It comes from sulfur and nitrogen, fellas. It's your building blocks. Now, there's other things added to it, but your building blocks are there. Got to have it. We don't get the sulfur we used to get, you know. We used to have a lot of diesel burn it, uh, companies from coal and stuff. Now you got the scrubbers on top, you got low sulfur diesel. Uh, last time they measured it over the U.S., it was 75% less sulfur concentrated than it was 20 years ago. So we just don't get it, and it's something. It's also a natural insecticide, too. We used sulfur dust years ago before we had insecticides for potato leaf hoppers, de lice cattle. Just kind of forgot. It made it easier for that jug in the sprayer, don't it? Not that you can't use them, but they're all alternatives out there, okay? And sulfur, it takes sulfur to break that stuff down. And, uh, and nitrogen, whether you create your own nitrogen, but you gotta have a little bit. There's a, a brochure on the digester. So this is also a big part of our program, but uh, I tell you fellas, we're making some really nice soils out there, and we're gonna continue to work with uh, some of the stuff that he's doing and see how that goes with things. And because I, like I say, if it helps the soils, that's what we're, we're for. And um, we want to see that happen. So we're going to continue to uh, keep striving to make that. You know, I got to tell you one fellow here from Southwest Ohio or Southeast Ohio. Southeast Ohio is not all flat. It's pretty, pretty hilly down in there. And I got a fellow that farms right around 2,900 acres there. And all corn back to back now for, check this out, 36 years. Um, three years ago, we had a pretty good drought in Ohio. And even some of our top-notch farmers, or what they say top-notch and produce the highest yields, were 140, 150 bushel. That was their best fields. These boys have been using Instacal for right at 20 years, been our program for 20 plus years. And in the hills, 230 to 40 bushel corn. No water. How do you do that? He's got his soil working where he can bring some water up and down. He's got a good bacteria count, he's got good organics working for him. You know, that was quite a difference in yield on a drought year. There's just so many good things to look for, fellas. And uh, I, you know, our company was designed to help the farmer produce profits and, and take care of our soils because our soils are so critically important. If you take care of them, they'll reward us. Any questions, fellas? Yeah, I have these booklets. Show some of the test data. 